Hello, fifth grade. Um, I decided that today I'm going to read some from Joel, a boy of Galilee, for you. Um, you don't have to watch this video, but if you feel like you're reading it and you really don't understand what's going on in the story, I figured I'll record myself reading so we can kind of discuss it as we go. Um, and if you want to listen and follow along, that's fine. If you want to just read it on your own and answer the questions, that's fine too. It's whatever you feel comfortable with for this. I would like you still to read it on your own. Don't just listen to the video. But I figured for those of you who maybe aren't understanding what you're reading, I'll read it for you and that way you have that as an option too. I did post um, some vocabulary activities on Google Classroom. So you have some Quizlet um, activities to do with the vocabulary now so you don't have to just define them. And there's also um, questions for each chapter to answer on Google Classroom as well. So I suggest for reading, find yourself a nice comfy spot to sit in. Um, I have my nice comfy couch. I'm going to sit and do my reading in. You can do that with your textbook reading also. This is, you know, really a good opportunity to not have to sit in those uncomfortable desks all the time. So anyway, make yourself comfortable. And I'm going to read from Chapter 4. Okay, so this is chapter four, of Joel, a boy of Galilee. Next morning, a goodly train set out from the gates of Nathan ben Obed. It was near the time of the feast of the Passover, and he, with many of his household, was going down to Jerusalem. And by the way, you may have forgotten since it's been so long, but in the last chapter, we had just read about the old shepherd who could remember um when Jesus was born and he heard all the angels and he saw them all and then he went to meet Jesus when he was born and placed in the manger. That was what happened in the last chapter. So um, Nathan ben Obed, that's the man who worked with the shepherd. Okay, so he's the old man that they're visiting with right now on the way to the market. And they're going to Jerusalem. The family and guests were first on mules and donkeys. Behind them followed a train of servants, driving the lambs, goats, and oxen to be offered as sacrifices in the temple or sold in Jerusalem to other pilgrims. All along the highway, workmen were busy repairing the bridges and cleaning the springs and wells, soon to be used by the throngs of travelers. All the tombs near the great thoroughfares were being freshly whitewashed. They gleamed with a dazzling purity through the green trees, only to warn passers-by of the defilement within. For had those on their way to the feast approached too near these homes of the dead, even unconsciously, they would have been accounted unclean and unfit to partake of the Passover. Nothing escaped Joel's quick sight, from the tulips and marigolds flaming in the fields to the bright-eyed little viper crawling along the stone wall. Okay, so remember, they all have to go to Jerusalem for Passover, um, the faithful Jewish people do. And if they come into contact with anything dead, they will be considered unclean and they can't be part of the Passover feast. So that's why they're saying they have to keep their distance from all the tombs. And I'm on page 58 in my hardcover book or in the smaller book. So remember, if you have one of those, the thinner, larger book, it's going to be a different page. I'm on page 58. But while he looked, he never lost a word that passed between his friend Phineas and their host. The pride of an ancient nation took possession of him as he listened to the prophecies they quoted. Everyone they met along the way coming from Capernaum had something to say about this new prophet who had arisen in Galilee. When they reached the gate of the city, a great disappointment awaited them. He had been there and gone again. Nathan ben Obed and his train tarried only one night in the place and then pressed on again towards Jerusalem. Phinehas went with them. You shall go with us next year, he said to Joel. Then you will be over twelve. I shall take my own little ones too, and their mother. Only one more year, exclaimed Joel joyfully. If that passes as quickly as the one just gone, it will soon be here. Look after my little family, said the carpenter at parting. Come every day to the work if you wish, just as when I am here. And remember, my lad, you are almost a man. Almost a man? The words rang in the boy's thoughts all day as he pounded and cut keeping time to the swinging motion of hammer and saw. 
almost a man, but what kind of one? Crippled and maimed, shorn of the strength that should have been his pride, beggared of his priestly birthright. Page 59. Almost it might be, but never in its fullness could he hope to attain the proud statue of the proud stature of a perfect man. A fiercer hate sprang up for the enemy who had made him what he was, and the wild burning for revenge filled him so he could not work. He put away his tools and went up the narrow outside stairway that led to the flat roof of the carpenter's house. It was called the upper chamber. Here a latticed pavilion, thickly overgrown with vines, made a cool green retreat where he might rest and think undisturbed. Sitting there, he could see the flash of white sails on the blue lake and slow-moving masses of fleecy clouds in the blue of the sky above. They brought before him the picture of the flocks feeding on the pastures of Nathan ben Obed. Then, naturally enough, there flashed through his mind a thought of buzz. He seemed to see him squinting his little eyes to take aim at a leaf overhead. He heard the stone whirr through it as buzz said, I'd blind him. Some very impossible plans crept into Joel's daydreams just then. He imagined himself sitting in a high seat, wrapped in robes of state. Soldiers stood around him to carry out his slightest wish. The door would open and Rahum would be brought forth in fetters. So Joel's kind of daydreaming about what he would do to Rahum if he ever sees him again. On page 60. <clears throat> What is your will concerning the prisoner, O most gracious sovereign? The jailer would ask. Joel closed his eyes and waved his hands before an imaginary audience. Away with him, to the torture! Wrench his limbs on the rack! Brand his eyelids with hot irons! Let him suffer all that man can suffer and live! Thus shall it be done unto the man on whom the king delighteth to take vengeance. Joel was childish enough to take a real satisfaction in this scene he conjured up, but as it faded away, he was man enough to realize it could never come to pass, save in his imagination. Honey, go take it in the other room. He could never be in such a position for revenge unless that moment a possible way seemed to open for him. Phineas would probably see his friend of Nazareth at the Passover. What could be more natural than that the old friendship should be renewed? He whose hand had changed the water into wine should finally cast out the alien king who usurped the throne of Israel. For one in whose veins the blood of David ran royal red. What was more to be expected than that? So he's thinking about how they thought Jesus was going to take over as king of Israel on earth. And so he thought they're gonna, he's going to kick out the Romans and everything. So he's imagining that happening now. The Messiah would come to his kingdom, and then, and then, the thought leaped to its last daring limit. Phineas, who had been his earliest friend and playfellow, would, be, would he not be lifted to the right hand of power? Through him, then, lay the royal road to revenge. The thought lifted him unconsciously to his feet. I'm on page 61. He stood with his arms outstretched in the direction of the faraway temple, like some young prophet. David's cry of triumph rose to his lips. Thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle, he murmured. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. So he's thinking about Jesus giving Phinehas a lot of power, since they're friends. And so he's saying if Phinehas has the power and Joel can do whatever he wants because he's Phineas' friend. A sweet baby voice at the foot of the steps brought him suddenly down from the height of his intense feelings. So he's daydreaming all of this, and now he's brought back to reality. Joel, Joel, cried little Ruth, where is you? Then Jesse's voice added, we're all a-coming up for you to tell us a story. Up the stairs they swarmed to the roof, the carpenter's children, and half a dozen of their little playmates. Joel, with his head still in the clouds, told them of a mighty king who was coming to slay all other kings and change all tears, the waters of affliction, into the red wine of joy. Hmm, I don't think much of that story, said Jesse, with outspoken candor. I'd rather hear about Goliath or the bears that ate up the forty children. But Joel was in no mood for such stories. Just then, on some slight pretext, he escaped from his existence 
exacting audience, and went down to the seashore. Here, skipping stones across the water or riding idly in the sand, he was free to go on with his fascinating daydreams. On page 62. For the next two weeks, the boy gave up work entirely. He haunted the toll gates and public streets, hoping to hear some startling news from Jerusalem. He was so full of the thought that some great revolution was about to take place that he could not understand how people could be so indifferent. All on fire with the belief that this man of Nazareth was the one in whom lay the nation's hope. He looked and longed for the return of Phineas, but he might learn more of him. But Phineas had little to tell when he came back. He had met his friend twice in Jerusalem, the same gentle, quiet man he had always known, making no claims, making no wonders. Phineas had heard of his driving the money changers out of the temple one day, and those who sold doves in its sacred courts, although he had not witnessed this scene. The carpenter was rather surprised that he should have made such a public disturbance. Rabbi Phineas, said Joel, with a trembling voice, don't you think your friend is the prophet we are expecting? Phineas shook his head. No, my lad, I am sure of it now. I'm on page 63. So Phineas met Jesus a couple times when he was in Jerusalem, but he's not convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. But the herald angels and the star, insisted the boy. They must have proclaimed someone else. He is the best man I ever knew, but there is no more of the king in his nature than there is in mine. The man's positive answer seemed to shatter Joel's last hope. Downcast and disappointed, he went back to his work. Only with money could he accomplish his life's object, and only by incessant work could he earn the shining shekels that he needed. Phineas wondered sometimes at the dogged persistence with which the child stuck to his task, in spite of his tired, aching body. He had learned to make sandalwood jewel boxes and fancifully wrought cups to, the whole, to hold the various dyes and cosmetics used by the ladies of the court. Several times during the following months, he begged to sail in some of the fishing boats that landed at the town of Tiberias. Having gained the favor of the keeper of the gates, by various little gifts of his own manufacture, he always found a ready admittance to the palace. To the ladies of the court, the sums they paid for his pretty wares seemed trifling, but to Joel, the small bag of coin hidden in the folds of his clothes was a little fortune daily growing larger. <clears throat> so Joel is still making um, lots of things out of wood and selling them to people um, all over the area, mainly ladies for their makeup and stuff. So to them, it's not much, but to him, it means a whole lot because he feels like he's finally doing something worthwhile. Okay, so that's chapter four. So don't forget to do the vocabulary activities on Quizlet and answer the questions on Google Classroom. And then we'll move on to chapter five next time.